All right, we, this is chapter two on linear kinematics. So last week was quite a lengthy lecture talking about force vectors. We're still gonna build off of vector vectors, but now we're gonna sort of add some quantities, some values to those vectors. Okay, so when we talk about linear kinematics, we are talking about a change in position, okay, or motion. Remember, kinetics describes the forces that cause motion, such as force, power, things along those lines. And then kinematics are simply referring to positions or motions, not the causes that create these. So motion is change in position or location over time, and we have three different types of these. It is They are linear, angular, or both, also called general motion, which is what most motion you encounter throughout life generally is. So with linear motion, this is sort of similar to if you are just taking a piece of paper and sliding it across the table. So all points of the body move the same distance in the same direction at the same time. So a uniform translation. To sort of paint a picture to this, a rectilinear translation or rectilinear motion looks like that skater right there and then a curvilinear all the points are moving the same uh, distance but just not in a straight line okay so there's no twisting or turning going on everything is just sort of sliding and all the points relative to one another move the same angular motion is rotation so movement about an axis so when we talked about torque so if the gymnast is spinning on the bar, the bar is the axis. So all of the points on the body are not moving the same distance. His feet are moving a much greater distance than his elbows. Okay, but they are moving, they are both rotating about the axis. And then real world motion or general motion, we have a combination of both linear and angular motion. All right, this is most human motion. To sort of paint a picture for this, we have rectilinear, curvilinear, rotational about that middle axis, and then general motion combining all of these. When we talk about describing motion, we need to understand relative position. So we need to know where something is in space. We'll typically use a Cartesian coordinate system like the one below. Same thing you'll see like on any kind of graph. We have positive up and to the right, negative down and to the left. We use the metric system, meters, centimeters. If you did your lab or you read the articles and saw the videos, okay, we can have a better understanding of how biomechanists collect position data. So we place these specific markers on landmarks of the body and we use cameras to track these. And then the data is gonna record the positions of these markers across time to sort of give us a video and then we can paint a big, bigger picture as to what motions are going on. But the first thing we need is we just need to know position in space. So that's why a lot of these motion capture softwares will first need to calibrate the system and find a zero point in the middle. And then anywhere these points move relative to that zero is going to be their value. Getting into some values in linear kinematics, first one we'll talk about is displacement. So displacement is the straight line difference between two points or their overall change in position from one spot to another. Displacement is a vector. So remember when we talked about vectors in the last chapter, they show us magnitude, direction, and point of application. So the big one to remember here is the direction. We will also talk about scalar values, which only describe magnitude but vectors are going to have direction and value. The equation for distance is the final point minus the initial point. 
Similar to displacement is a value called distance. And this is the length of the path traveled to get to a new position. And this is the one that's going to be scalar, only magnitude. So we don't have a specific direction for distance, just how far it is. Whereas for displacement, we are going to have how far and in what direction. To paint you a picture here, the blue dots are position. Blue is going to be distance. As you can see, it did not travel in a straight line. We don't care what direction it is. We just care the total amount of distance that was traveled. So we will get a magnitude. And then displacement is going to be the red arrow, which just shows us from point A to point B in a straight line and what direction that line is going. Okay, so don't forget the differences here between distance and displacement. Distance is scalar. Displacement is a vector. So now we're going to do a little bit more concrete example with some actual values in here. So we're going to calculate what these values are. If we know that the starting position is at x of 20 meters and y of 10 meters, x being in the horizontal, y in the vertical, and then the final point, x is at 50, y is at 60, so moving up and to the right, Everything is still positive values. To calculate what the displacement is, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So if we simply take the difference in the x direction and the difference in the y direction, we are going to get our two sides to the triangle. You can sort of see that x traveling in on the bottom, y to the right of it, and that red line will be the uh, displacement or also the, um, or the hypotenuse. That's the word I'm looking for. So the red line is the hypotenuse of the triangle. So if we know two sides and we want to solve the hypotenuse, we can use a squared plus b squared equals c squared, which will give us 58.3 meters. Hopefully you can see that um, all they did here was took the distance in the x direction squared plus the distance in the y direction squared, took the square root of that to get us the hypotenuse of 58.3 meters. If you have any questions on calculating those sides, be sure to check out chapter one again on how we calculated the hypotenuse. Otherwise, we will move on. To find the angle or the direction of the displacement, because remember, displacement is a vector, so we want to know the magnitude and the direction, we can use the inverse trig functions. So what I mean by the inverse is you can press second on your calculator, tangent, Remember, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So we do tangent or inverse tangent of 50 divided by 30, which will give us 59 degrees. So plug in any of uh, any of the sides that you want to use. Just remember which ones go with sine, cosine, and tangent. We're going to use that inverse trig function to calculate the angle. Now if we want to describe linear motion on a graph, a lot of the times you will see position on the y-axis going up and down and then time on the x-axis. So what this will be describing is change in position over time. So T1, P1, or Ti, Pi, the initial point in time over time will increase in a positive value of position. So it is changing in a positive direction over time. A little bit longer time period here, greater variance in the change in position. So how does position change with respect to time? And the you can see change in time, change in position. That would be called our velocity. 
So we want to understand how position changes over time. That is meters per second. We'll talk about that here coming up. So velocity is the rate of change in position. It is also a vector, meaning that you'll have a direction and a magnitude. And the units we use are centimeters per second, meters per second. The equation here is delta P over delta T, or change in position over time. And remember, the change in position is also displacement. And then our velocity is going to be the slope of this line. So you can imagine that if we have a greater change in position over a less period of time, we are going to have a higher velocity. So the steeper that slope, the greater the velocity. The more, um, the less steep or the less inclined to that slope, we are going to have a lower change in position over a greater period of time, meaning that it is a low velocity. Similar to velocity, we'll talk about speed. So speed is our scalar quantity for this rate of change. And we're talking about the rate of change in distance. So remember, distance is a scalar quantity, and so is speed. And then vice versa, we have velocity and displacement are going to be our vectors. Same thing we can use here, meters per second, centimeters per second. Now, it's basically the same calculation, but instead of using displacement, we are using distance, which is what makes it scalar. Talk about the slope, change in position over change in time. I already touched on this a little bit. So when we have no slope, B, we have no velocity. So that means the position is not changing as time goes on. And when we have a slope going downwards, that means position is going in the backwards direction or towards a negative value as time goes on. So this would be a negative velocity. What I want you to do right now is I want you to pause this video, go into the slideshow, or you can um, YouTube this clip right here, the 2009 Men's 100 Meter World Championship. I'm not going to take up time in this video to go over it, but I just want to sort of paint a picture for you in this graph to come up. So this is an incredible race that happened at the 2009 um, I believe Olympics, I don't believe World Championship, oh yeah, correct, World Championships right there. So at the 2009 World Championships, Usain Bolt broke another record. Okay, we're going to look at this in terms of a graph. So right here, we've got velocity over time. During the race, Usain Bolt and Tyson Gay were side by side. Once you get up to that three seconds, this is where Usain Bolt starts breaking away. You get into that six second time period, he's really um, announcing his lead. And then at that nine and a half second point, he clearly is the winner of the race. So how does velocity change with respect to time? So we talked about position over time. Now when we talk about velocity over time, that is meters per second per second or meters per second squared, also known as acceleration. So acceleration is our change in velocity. This is also a vector. Remember, velocity is a vector, so, so will acceleration, meaning we have a direction and a magnitude. So change in velocity over change in time is going to be our equation for acceleration. Looking at this graph again, Right here, we have a positive acceleration. Okay, velocity is increasing as time goes on. Another positive acceleration. Here, Usain Bolt starts to have a greater acceleration than Tyson Gay. So he, this is where he starts announcing his lead. Here we have no acceleration, so they sort of reach their top speed and start leveling off. And then towards the end of the race, we will have a negative acceleration or slowing down. So hopefully this makes sense. Remember, we talk about acceleration going backwards or 
acceleration slowing down. This is a negative acceleration, not deceleration. This is a picture from the book and a graph that you should know. So on the left is going to be talking about the direction of movement. Left is negative, right is positive, and we will also be talking about whether or not it is a positive velocity, acceleration, and then the change in motion. So if somebody is speeding up, their velocity and acceleration are both going in the positive direction, we will have a positive velocity, okay, a positive change in motion, speeding up, and then a positive direction of acceleration. If the velocity is going in the positive direction, but they are not accelerating, so they're holding a constant velocity, we still have a positive velocity, so they're still moving in the positive direction. They are not speeding up or slowing down, so they have a zero here, which means a zero acceleration. If they are still traveling in that positive direction, so velocity is going to the right, but they are slowing down in this direction. We still have a positive velocity. They're moving to the right, but they are slowing down, so they will have a negative acceleration, the negative change in motion. Inversely, they're moving in the negative direction, and they're speeding up while doing this. This will be a negative velocity because they're moving in the negative direction. They are speeding up, so that is that positive value, but it is a negative acceleration because remember acceleration is a vector quantity. We want to know the direction and the direction is in the negative, direct, the negative um, direction in the Cartesian coordinate system. We have an acceleration value, so they are still speeding up. They are just speeding up in the negative direction. Again, they're traveling in the negative direction to the left, but they are not accelerating. Negative velocity, zero change in motion, zero acceleration. They are going at constant speed. Slowing down in that negative direction, they are have a negative velocity. They're still going to the left. A negative change in motion because they're slowing down, but this will be a positive acceleration because acceleration is moving in the right direction. Okay, if you look at that A arrow moving to the right signifies a positive vector for this. Now let's take a look at an example. So John begins stationary and then runs to a location that is negative 50 meters away in seven seconds. We want to calculate his displacement, his distance, his velocity, and his speed. So we're going to switch over to a whiteboard talk on this right now. All right, for this first example, so we know John begins stationary, so he's not moving anywhere, and he runs to a location that is negative 50 meters away. So we're just going to draw this out. So he starts at zero, goes to negative 50. We can go down to the left, however. We just know he's going negative 50. It doesn't really matter what way we draw it out. Okay, it's kind of irrelevant right, right now. We know it's negative. So first thing we want to calculate is we want to calculate displacement. So we know for displacement, this is our equation. Displacement is the final point minus the initial point. So if we have negative 50 minus 0, our displacement is going to be negative 50. Pretty straightforward there. Okay, next we're going to want to calculate distance. Distance is just the same exact measurement. We know that he's going in a straight line, so that is going to be the same value. So for distance, all we don't have is the direction. So distance is just 50 meters. Okay, distance 
doesn't care what direction. It is a scalar, not a vector. Next, we're going to get into velocity. So we have change in position over change in time. Change in po position is synonymous with displacement. Change in P is point final minus point initial. So this can be replaced with D. So if we plug in the values that we know, we know that he traveled there in seven seconds. Our velocity is going to come out to negative seven point. That's supposed to be one four negative seven point one four meters per second because we're dividing meters by seconds. Last thing we're going to calculate is speed. The equation for speed is distance divided by the change in time. So for the speed, pretty much the same thing as velocity, except we don't have a direction. This is scalar, this is vector. does not have a negative value. All right, so that's how we solve for all these. All you have to know is the equation, plug in what you know, use your basic algebra. So as we've calculated, displacement, distance, and velocity. You can see velocity and displacement both have negative values because these are vectors and then distance and speed are just magnitude because they are a scalar quantity. Let's take a look at another example. So Lorraine sprints and she travels five meters at an angle of 35 degrees from the horizontal, seen in that picture right there. See, so she reaches the new position in 0 0.5 seconds. We want to find what's her average horizontal displacement and average horizontal velocity. Again, we're going to pause for a second and take it to a whiteboard to work this out. Okay, for this problem, we know that Lorraine sprints and she travels five meters at an angle of 35 degrees from the horizontal. And then she reaches her new position in 0 0.5 seconds. So I'm gonna first start by drawing this out. Start here. She travels five meters. She travels at an angle of 5 meters, 35 degrees from the horizontal. From that, we want to calculate what is her average horizontal displacement and average horizontal velocity. Horizontal displacement or velocity. So this is going to be our x. Just to paint a picture here, this is our y, but we are solving for the horizontal in x. So first thing we want to do, let's calculate what is the horizontal displacement? So we need to solve for what is the length of this side? How far is she traveling horizontally? So based on what we know, we've got an angle, we've got a sine, or a side, the hypotenuse, we can use cosine. Cosine of 35 is going to equal the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Do some rearranging. V of x equals now 
I would get d of x by itself. Multiply by 5 meters, get d of x over here. Now we just solve. So the average horizontal displacement, or our side x, is going to be 4.10 meters. Now that we have the distance, the horizontal uh, displacement, I should say, the horizontal displacement, now we're going to calculate the average horizontal velocity. So remember, our equation for velocity is displacement over change in time. like so our velocity in the x direction is equal to our displacement of x divided by change in time. So we're just going to plug in the values that we know. already told that it took her a half second to get there, so we just plug that in. Velocity in the x direction, 8.2 meters per second. Let's say we wanted to calculate her actual velocity. If we wanted to calculate her actual velocity, what we would do is take the actual line traveled, 5 meters, divided by the time taken to get there. But we're just calculating what's the velocity horizontally. So in football, it doesn't matter how far you move this way. It only matters how far you move relative to the goal line or how quickly are you moving to the goal line. So let's just sort of paint you a picture of the difference between horizontal displacement and velocity versus the um, actual displacement or velocity if it's at a given angle. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Same thing. Plug in the values that you know, draw out a triangle if you got it, do your basic algebra. As we calculated on the whiteboard, we found the average horizontal displacement and the average horizontal velocity. So all these examples that we've done um, have given us average kinematic quantities. So we are assuming that there was a constant behavior going on during this motion. Generally in human motion, nobody's just going at a constant velocity or constant acceleration. Usually things are going up or down. So having smaller time intervals are going to allow us to be more accurate with this. The larger the time intervals we use, the less accurate description of motion. So those motion capture softwares that are used in labs are going to take very, very small time intervals to get a precise calculation of that movement. So using the decimals of seconds in change of position is going to give you very accurate data. So the ones that we've been doing so far, we're just assuming averages across that time. For more practice on these, check out page 80 to 83 of the textbook. Okay, at the end of chapter 2, and then the answers for these are found on page 400 to 401. Okay, hopefully this stuff is just building off of our vectors that we learned from chapter 1. None of this is too crazy. None of the equations are way too out there. All right, the only difficult thing about some of these is going to be doing some of those trig functions to calculate a side or to calculate an angle. Other than that, Remember, negatives, positives, vectors versus scalar quantities, don't forget those.